speaker is going to be Thomas Lively, who's going to be talking about a brief tour of Binarian. Thomas is... Are you senior engineer or super senior engineer at Google? Staff now. Staff yeah. engineer at Google. You heard it here first. So let's take it away, Thomas. All right. Thank you, Conrad. Let's make sure this works. Nope. All right. Uh, it's okay. I'll hit the space bar. Oh, it's supposed to be plugged in? Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas Lively. I am, uh, as you heard, a software engineer at Google. Uh, I'm on the WebAssembly tools team. Thank you. Great. OK. Uh, where I work full time on WebAssembly, which is like a dream job for me. So I'm super excited to have it. Uh, so this talk is going to be about Binarian, which is one of the open source uh, code bases that I work in quite a lot. But I do a whole bunch of different WebAssembly things. So I also work a bit on Imscripten, which is the C++ to WebAssembly toolchain that actually predates WebAssembly by quite a bit. It used to compile to Asm.js and just normal JavaScript before that. Uh, and I'm also very active uh, on the spec side of things. So I chair the uh, GC subgroup and the new threads subgroup. Uh, in the W3C community group. Uh, so I love WebAssembly, and uh, I love being on the industrial side of WebAssembly. I love writing code. I love you know, having users tell us that their stuff goes fast. Uh, but I also love uh, being here on the academic side, because I think all of the formal specification, all of the uh, proofs and, and everything, all those Greek letters, I love that stuff, and I'm super glad that I still get to see it, even though I'm now in industry. Uh, so let's kick off a brief tour of Binarian. So what is Binarian? Binarian is, first and foremost, a WebAssembly optimization framework. All right, So it's an open source uh, repository, C++ code. It's in the WebAssembly org on GitHub, uh, so you can go check it out. Uh, it's, it's sort of like existed as long as WebAssembly has. Uh, so it's an optimizer. It's a compiler infrastructure. It has sort of like a, a pass runner uh, mechanism. You can write new binarian passes and, and run them. Uh, it's a suite of other tools in addition to the optimizer, and we'll see those. It's also a C library, so you can embed it in other programs and call it as a library. And using Imscripten, which I mentioned earlier, we compile the code base to WebAssembly and wrap it up as a nice JavaScript library that's on NPM. So uh, lots of different ways to use Binarian and get access to all the optimization goodness. So, what do I want to talk about? First of all, I would like to convince you all that you should care about Binarian and maybe use it. And maybe, if I'm lucky, even contribute a bit to it. Now, uh, Daniel Hillerstrom's group uh, for WASMFX has been contributing to uh, Binarian, uh, implementing support for their new instructions. And that's been awesome. And I would love for more people to help uh, experiment with new things for WebAssembly in Binarian. So then, presupposing that you care about Binarian, I'd like to go into a little bit about what you would want to know about it. All right? So what are sort of like the, the headline items in Binarian uh, that you would want to know before uh, taking a look at the code base? And then what are the opportunities in Binarian? Because it's a really exciting space, writing all these optimizations. And honestly, we're just scratching the surface. And I think that it could be a pretty cool academic project in addition to industrial projects to take these WebAssembly optimizations even further. So uh, the Binarian tools are WASMOPT. That's the optimizer. We have an assembler. We have an interpreter, a disassembler. We have a linker, so you can take two WebAssembly modules and just smash them together into one bigger WebAssembly module, which is pretty nice. We have WASM split, which does the opposite. You can take one WebAssembly module and you can split it up into multiple WebAssembly modules. And that's pretty cool because we can use that for lazy code loading. So if I have a giant multi-megabyte 
uh, WASM binary, maybe it's Photoshop or it's Sheets or it's some giant application, I can split it up into multiple modules using that tool and have them dynamically loaded at runtime as the functions are needed. So that's neat. We also have special purpose tools. Uh, so here's one called WASM CTOR eval. This is uh, to pre-evaluate uh, WebAssembly constructors. All right. So if you have like a C++ application, for instance, it might have a bunch of global constructors. <coughs> we can pre-compute those and serialize the result as an output WebAssembly module. <coughs> and then when you run it, you don't need to run those constructors anymore. They've already been run. And I know the uh, Bytecode Alliance also has a tool called Wiser that does pretty much the exact same thing. Um, we even have a compiler, Wasm to JS, that does what it says. It compiles your WebAssembly to JavaScript. And we have Wasm Reduce, which is a test case reducer. So if you find uh, a WebAssembly module that triggers some bug <coughs> in a tool you've written, or your interpreter, or your engine, you can throw it into WASM Reduce, and it will automatically use all of Binarian's optimization passes and other uh, modifications to reduce that binary to something much smaller that still triggers your bug. So this is great for, for you know, filing bug reports on things. Uh, so as you can see, it's pretty eclectic, and we're kind of happy to throw whatever tools you want in there. So if you think that there should be some tool for WebAssembly that doesn't exist, and you want to reuse all of the code we have in Binarian, come let us know. You know we're happy to throw your tool in here, too. Uh, so yes, very large toolkit. And Binarian is also sort of a narrow waste in the WebAssembly ecosystem. So I have some languages here. Uh, you've got your Cs, your C++'s. You have things like Python and PHP and Ruby that go via C and C++, via Emscripten to get to WebAssembly. You have purpose-built languages like uh, AssemblyScript and Grain that compile to WebAssembly. You have uh, your Javas, your OCamels, your Haskells that go to WebAssembly. And every one of these languages in some way uses Binarian all right, in their tool chain. For a lot of them, it's optional. Right? Binarian is a WebAssembly to WebAssembly optimizer, so you can always just not run it. Right? You start with WebAssembly, you want to end up with WebAssembly, you can just not run Binarian. But when you're compiling with optimizations enabled, if you run Binarian, you just get all that optimization goodness that we've developed basically for free. Uh, so some of these languages, like C and C++, using Binarian is optional. We only do it in the optimizing uh, tiers, or uh, <coughs> optimizing uh, compilations. For other languages, like AssemblyScript, Binarian is actually their entire compiler backend. So they're using Binarian JS, and their front end uh, calls directly into it to emit WebAssembly in the first place. So for them, it's mandatory. But either way, we're happy if you use Binarian. Uh, so what do you get when you optimize with Binarian? Your performance of your WebAssembly modules can increase by around 2x. And this is the number specifically for the J to WASM, so Java to WebAssembly benchmarks. Uh, and your code size will go even more down 4x. And this is after we do an initial dead code elimination. Then all our other uh, optimizations will reduce code size by 4x. If you include that initial dead code elimination, then it's actually 9x. So this can make a huge difference for your uh, code size. So there's a huge toolkit. It's really good for your binary size and performance. Everyone uses it. And it's very well maintained. All right, so this is the uh, sort of GitHub contribution stats over time. You can see it starts way back in 2015, and it's basically just been going steady ever since. I think the huge spikes at the beginning are because we were uh, not squashing the commits. So there's just like a lot of commits back then. 
but you can see basically every week since then we're averaging between you know 10 and 20 uh, PRs or commits every week. So it's a very active project and uh, it's very up to date, right? So all the latest features uh, that are um, you know standards track have been implemented. We have GC, uh, we have threads. We're going to have shared everything threads. We have exception handling. We have the old one. We're working on the new one. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Daniel's group uh, working on WASMFX, the, the effect handlers. So it's very up to date. Um, so you can take advantage of that too if you work with it. So okay, that was kind of the end of my leg. This is why you should care, Spiel. So hopefully you're hooked. So what are some interesting things about Binarian? First of all, uh, its intermediate representation might not be what you expect for an optimizer. Uh, Binarian's IR is an AST, all right? We're not using SSA and uh, we're not using anything else. It doesn't, it's not even a stack machine, it's an AST. Uh, so this WebAssembly fragment here i32.const1, i32.const2, i32.add. Even though in WebAssembly that's a linear sequence of instructions, in binary and IR that would be a tree. So we would have an expression for the i32.add and it would have two expression children, the i32.const1 and the i32.const2. Uh, so why is that? Well, it's a historical accident. You see, way back before WebAssembly 1.0, there was a period of time when WebAssembly was going to be an AST. And binarians from way back then, and we just never changed it. <laughs> so you can see there's this nice issue from August 4th, 2016, future of binarian in a stack machine world, where such various options such as deprecate binarian were considered. Uh, so yes, yeah, so there was a lot of hand wringing back in 2016 about what we were going to do, and it turns out the answer was just keep on trucking. So we didn't really change anything in Binarian, and it's it's worked out pretty well for us so far. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, so with a few caveats that I'll, I'll go through now. So, for example, multi-value. All right, multi-value was not in the MVP uh, WebAssembly. It was added later. We mostly support it, uh, and but you know we got to fit it into an AST. So if you have a block that returns not one but two i32s, how are we going to represent that as an AST with these tuple things? So this WebAssembly turns into this binary in IR with a block whose child is a tuple.make instruction, which does not exist in WebAssembly. This is only in Binarian. And that tuple.make is uh, the parent of i32.const1 and i32.const2. And of course, when we emit a binary, we just skip the tuple.make. It doesn't exist. And everything works out. But now all of our optimizations kind of need to worry about tuples and, and the fact that they can exist. So it is a complication. Second, uh, sometimes we need scratch locals. So here's some perfectly valid and very short WebAssembly. It pushes uh, const1 onto the stack, calls some function that doesn't return anything or take anything, and then it executes i32.eqz which, because our call didn't modify the stack at all, pops the i32.const1 off. No problem. Well, when we parse that into binary and IR, it needs to be an AST. So that i32.eqz needs to have a child that produces that i32.const1 as a value. But we can't reorder things in general because this call might have side effects. So we have no choice but to introduce a scratch local. And so Binarian's parser will produce this IR. The EQZ is the parent of a block that we've synthesized, where the block contains a local that's set to a scratch variable that we've synthesized of the i32.const1. Then it executes, that shouldn't be a NOP, that should be that call. Uh, and then it does a local.get of the scratch local. 
to then produce that i32.const1 value that can feed into the i32.eqz. So between turning stacky code into this monstrosity in the tuples, sometimes the IR can be seriously bloated compared to your input WebAssembly. So that is definitely a downside of using the AST intermediate representation. On the other hand, we don't need to like redo years of work by keeping it, so it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, another fact about binary and IR is that it keeps the types around, okay? So this is unlike WebAssembly itself, where the instructions aren't all annotated with the types. Uh, in binary and IR, every expression has a type. So here, they would all be I32, pretty simple. But if we change this to be the unreachable instruction, which traps, then in binary and IR, we assign that a type called unreachable, which does not exist in WebAssembly. So in WebAssembly, if I have an unreachable instruction or an unconditional branch, the types it leaves on the stack are polymorphic. You can pretend they're whatever you want, T star, for any T star, which means after an unreachable or an unconditional branch or any other instruction that never really returns, in normal WebAssembly, we're allowed to have any instruction we want. And we want to sort of emulate that behavior of allowing any instruction we want in binary and IR. So we introduce this unreachable type, which infects all the parents, all right? So because this expression is unreachable, that makes its parent unreachable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this one's still I32, but this add is now unreachable. And that tells us that the add will never return. In fact, it'll never be reached, but it also won't return. Uh, so yeah, our, our type system, we have tuples and we have unreachable, and we also have uh, a none type. So this call that doesn't return anything would have none type uh, in binary, and which also doesn't exist in WebAssembly. So our choice to have, have this tree structure does introduce a few oddities and things that don't exist in the underlying WebAssembly. Was none different from unreachable? The question was, how is none different from unreachable as a type? Yeah. Uh, so none isn't infected. It, like, it doesn't infect the parent. Um, and it's also not allowed to appear anywhere except inside a block. Uh, so like a drop instruction, right? Drops its child and has type none. It doesn't return anything. The only place in binary and IR that you're allowed to have a drop is either like at the top level, like your whole thing's a drop, or it's inside a block where uh, blocks are allowed to have a sequence of non-typed expressions potentially followed by a concretely typed expression. So it's more like a unit type, not a bottom type then? Correct, yes. So yes, a, and again, we're software engineers, so we would right. never be confused by that, because we don't know what bottom <laughs> types are. Yes. Although, yeah, so obviously now that we've implemented WASMGC, we do have heap type none, which is the bottom type, and then we also have type none, which is this other completely unrelated thing. So, yeah, yeah. So, all right, that's, that's all I had to say on binary and IR. It's a little weird, but it gets the job done. Uh, so let's talk about sort of like, what does Binarian do with the IR? All right, so at its core, Binarian is just like a dumb pass runner. All right, you register a bunch of passes, and then it runs them one at a time. Uh, and each pass has the IR, and it can do whatever it wants with it, and then it ends, and, and then the next pass runs. And really, the only constraints on, on what happens in a pass is that it must leave the IR valid. So we have a validator that runs in between passes, uh, if you're in debug mode, and, and as long as that passes, as long as the validator passes, 
the passes can do whatever they want. So usually what they want to do is walk the IR. All right, so they want to walk this tree and perform some analysis or make some modifications. And so we have all kinds of utilities. Uh, we're very into our shareable utilities in Binarian because we've got dozens and dozens of passes and they all basically want to do the same thing, which is walk the IR. So uh, if you'll excuse the C++, uh, this is a example utility that's going to collect a list of all of the um, expressions of a particular type. So it's called Finder, and it's generic over some expression type T, and it's going to uh, collect a std vector of, of pointers to T. So T might be binary. Okay, Binary is the class representing all binary operations in the IR, or it might be unary. Or it might be some crazy SIMD class that represents some niche SIMD instruction, right? We have a few dozen of those. Uh, so, or it might be a local get or a struct get or whatever. Uh, Finder is a subclass of this postwalker utility. All right, this is the this is the reusable part. And so postwalker is going to be this generic thing that knows how to walk the IR in post order. Notice that as a template parameter, postwalker takes finder itself. Uh, so the superclass has the subclass as part of its bound. So in C++, we call this the curiously recursive template pattern. But you all might like to refer to it as uh, uh, f-bounded polymorphism instead. Uh, I don't know what that is, but you might. <laughs> uh, so yeah. And then we also tell the walker how it's going to visit each expression. And notice that also takes finder. So there's more f-bounded polymorphism there. Uh, and because this is a unified expression visitor, we're going to visit every single expression with just this visit expression method. All right, so what you don't see in this example are the implementations of postwalker and unified expression visitor with like hundreds of lines of just like very repetitive, like if it's this kind of expression, call this visitor method. If it's that kind of expression, call that visitor method, right? We get to share all that code and we don't need to write it every time. And then what's this visit expression going to do? It's going to be called for every node in the IR and it's going to be generically typed as expression, which is a superclass of all the different expression nodes. And then what we can do is we can do a dynamic cast on it to T, right, which is the expression type we're actually looking for. And if that succeeds, we can add it to our list. So relatively small amount of code to implement this basic utility that's just going to go find all the particular expression type. And we do this all over the place. Like we have dozens and dozens and dozens of subclasses of, of postwalker and, and visitors and, and all sorts of things. So if you do anything in Binarian, you'll definitely see this. So building on those walkers, we can build entire passes. So here is a real example from our code base. Uh, we have a pass called optimize instructions. This is our peephole optimizer that just looks at each instruction, looks at its children, and tries to simplify it if it can. So this is a walker pass, which is parameterized with a post walker of optimized instructions. Right? So there's that CRTP f-bounded polymorphism again. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we have this method. This is a virtual method, is function parallel, and we just say return true. So that's all I need to do to make my pass massively parallel. So uh, my workstation like exists up in the cloud somewhere, and I'm working on it every day. And it has something like a 128 cores, right? So whenever I'm running a binary and pass, if it's function parallel, it's just going to use all 128 cores automatically. It's just going to split up all the functions between them. So this is great. Uh, and then all I need to do to make that work is tell it 
how to create an instance of the pass for each thread, and the, the sort of like part where it splits up the functions and runs it on each thread, totally taken care of for me. So it's pretty easy to write passes that are walkers that do whatever you want in binary and IR. Uh, so I want to talk about what's like the latest and greatest in Binarian. What's the cutting edge? So we have this project to add a monotone framework to Binarian for static program analysis. So if you're not familiar, uh, this is uh, static program analysis sort of like theory in terms of lattices, which I've beautifully illustrated here, where uh, the lattice represents what you know about your program. So the top of the lattice is like, anything's possible, I don't know anything, uh, I give up, this isn't useful. And the bottom of the lattice is the most specific possible thing you can know, which is that like, nothing is possible, right? There, like, that's it, so I can just optimize the whole thing out. And then the cool thing is, individual facts about the program are different points on the lattice, and so the combination of individual facts about your program is the join of those two points on the lattice. And there's like nice theorems and stuff about how uh, if you start at the bottom and then find new facts about your program, you'll reach a fixed point uh, as, long as, as long as it's like a finite lattice and that's too strong. But anyway, yes, you can reach a fixed point, it'll terminate, and you'll have a sound analysis. Uh, so we take our lattice, we take our control flow graph, and we can actually give each uh, block in our control flow graph its own little lattice that is going to be a component of this single huge lattice that we're doing the analysis on. And then uh, what we, so here's an example um, that I'll run through. This is actually, I chose this example because it's the only one in the code base so far. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. As I said, this is the cutting edge. But we're going to try to find the most general type required at each program location with the goal of generalizing the output type of casts far enough that it is a super type of the input type and we can get rid of the cast. All right. Uh, so that's what we're working on. This is, is it okay if I add a clarification? Yes. This is for the garbage collected types feature, which actually adds object types to WebAssembly. So we're not just casting from I32 to whatever. Yeah, right. This is for WASMGC, which actually has subtyping. It has casts. Like, this is a real thing I want to do. Um, my, my users have asked me to eliminate their casts, so I, I'm going to try. Um, so I want the most general type. And I want to know the type that's required at each location. So this is going to be a backward analysis because requirements come from the future. And I need to track the type for each location. All right. So first, I would design a lattice for this. So here's the lattice uh, for val type. You can see it has our fancy type none, which is not a bottom type. It means literally no type. That's up here at the top. And our type unreachable here at the bottom, below the actual sort of like bottom types for each individual hierarchy of types from WASM GC. So here's our type lattice. We're clearly going to use this, but we're going to invert it because we want the most general uh, required type. So as I discover more program facts uh, and sort of go up my lattice, I actually want my uh, type to become less general. All right. Uh, so I've inverted the lattice. And right over here, this is literally the C++ type that I write uh, to, to represent this. So we have a library of general purpose lattices like val type and inverted, and we can compose them uh, arbitrarily to build up these bigger lattices. So then uh, I need to track the type for each uh, local in a function, all right? So I'm going to add the vector lattice to wrap my inverted val type lattice. And this creates a new lattice where each element is a vector of a particular size. That particular size will be determined by the number of locals in the function. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like sort of the lattice you'd expect from vectors where elements are compared element-wise. Uh, and then similarly, for the... Uh, 
stack values that aren't in locals, I can have a stack lattice, where the bottom is the empty stack, which is secretly an infinite stack of bottom elements, and the top is, uh, for example, this one in this picture, where the stack has null ref, null ref, and i32 at the top, and then an infinite sequence of bottom elements. And again, we can compare it element-wise without actually, you know, refining the infinite sequence of bottom elements at the bottom of the stack. And this all works out, and it's a proper lattice, and it's exactly what we need for our analysis. And then I can stick it all together with the tuple, so I keep track of the uh, locals, I keep track of the stack values, and that's like literally all the code I had to write for that, and then the rest of it is defining the transfer function, which takes a basic block and one of these lattice elements, and just traverses the basic block, updates the lattice element, and then returns a set of basic blocks that may be affected, may need to be reanalyzed, and like that's it. Uh, so this sort of framework where I can compose these lattices and then write transfer functions is, I would say, the cutting edge of, of where we're at in Binarian. Um, so it's not like we invented this stuff, but it's awfully fun to implement. And uh, I think there's a lot of room for, uh, for, for us to take it further. So in particular, we haven't done all the lattices we need for interprocedural analysis. So that's next. We could use a smarter pass manager that shares these analyses between different passes. Right now, every pass just also performs whatever analysis it needs. It's kind of slow. Uh, I'm currently working on a new text format parser. Right now, just like Binarian's IR is a little different from WebAssembly, the text format it accepts is a little different from WebAssembly too. It only accepts the nested form that matches the IR exactly. Uh, so I'm fixing that which will let us upstream all of our binarian tests as spec tests in the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that'll be nice. C++ 20 added generators, so we could, or coroutines that we can use to build generators, so we could use those instead of the crazy CRTP stuff for our uh, walkers, which would be very nice. And of course, we want to implement more proposals as they come down the line. So all the proposals that we're working on will definitely get implemented in Binarian. But if there are also proposals that you're working on, like effect handlers, then we'd love to get those implemented in Binarian as well. So this, this as I said, open source. Contributions very welcome. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Thomas, for that talk. So questions? Um, I'm going to bias against the other organizer. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think this is a kind of obvious question. You, you mentioned... Uh, um, we've definitely thought in the past, like, oh, should we add a second IR, should we, you know, change the IR, should we make changes? And the conclusion we've always come to is no, because despite the annoyances, there are benefits, right? It's really nice to be able to just look at an expression and then look at its children and say, okay, those are the values it consumes and that's where they come from. And like, that's it. You just followed one pointer, end of story. Um, so, that's pretty nice. The fact that the post-order traversal of this tree just corresponds to the exact code that's going to get output is also pretty nice. Uh, and the way types propagate up the tree, like that unreachable stuff, right? It just propagates up. Very simple, pretty easy to understand. So uh, I think there are benefits in, in how simple it is and how easy it is to do some kind of analyses on it. Andreas. Now I'm curious again. So how do you represent the cases that don't fall into this like more structured AST form? Okay. For one example is um, multi-value input to blocks, and we don't support that at all. Okay. Which is unfortunate. I mean, another example is you have multi-value output, and then you consume it kind of in a... 
Yeah. Non-structured fashion, right? Right. So we had uh, those tuples that I showed. So tuple.make. Yeah. So your output from the block would be like tuple.make. I package up a tuple. I return it. On the outside, if I consume it in a non-structured fashion, then I'm going to assign that tuple to a scratch tuple typed local yeah. and then use tuple.extract on the local everywhere I need it and oh. blow up my output code. One other quick question. So you talked about, you mentioned uh, upstreaming your tests. Yeah. Like how many tests are we talking about here? Like well, so uh, you're not going to be inundated with tests. I'd say the new parser will let us start writing spec text, spec tests that are upstreamable. Right now, in Binarian, we have very robust testing, um, and only one of our testing directories is called spec, and it has sort of like modified versions of the upstream spec tests that are like n years old, right? And have been like munged so Binarian can understand them. Uh, so it's going to be new tests we put in there that are now going to be upstreamable. We also have a ton of other tests that use the LLVM lit testing framework where you sort of just like have an input file and the output that you expect is in comments uh, in that file. So that's like completely unrelated to the spec tests. Those won't, that's the majority of our tests. Those won't be upstreamed. Can you tell me a little bit more about how your test case reducer works? Like, do you have like a user defined function that can say it still fails or passes? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's pretty dumb. You pass it a like arbitrary command as a command line argument, and it just like calls system and like runs that command and sees if the return code has changed. I think it looks at the return code and standard out and standard error and sees if they've changed. Um, <clears throat> so do you try to go back to the to um, a more compact form after expanding into the AST form, which may require more nodes? Do, do you guarantee that you will always find back the, the compact form if nothing changed? Yeah, so in the happy case where there was no multi-value and no stacky code in the input, then the IR actually has the same number of instructions, really, as, as the input. There are a few details, but then when you emit it, it'll be sort of one for one. In the unhappy case where there are multi-value things and stacky code and we need all these scratch locals, we do our best. Um, and, and obviously, it's an optimizer, so the whole thing is about trying to get the code size as small as possible. But um, we don't really have a great intermediate state between the IR and the emitted binary where we'd be able to do those fix-ups. Um, so if we need to bloat the binary or the, the IR with like tuples because we simply can't represent it any other way in the IR, then right now we're pretty limited in the amount of cleanup we can do before we go to binary. We do a little bit, um, but no, it, it's, there's no guarantee that, that it's going to be better. So then could it happen that um, overall the code becomes slower because of this Blue? Yeah, uh, I'm, you could easily construct a uh, sort of uh, terrible input binary specifically constructed to become slower, but um, sort of like for all practical cases, that's not, that's not going to be the case. Yeah. Kind of follow up on that. Is it at least true that you can convert every program back? Because like the, the, this tuple binding you mentioned, it seems to be more expressive. You could use the same tuple com component several times, right? Which you can't easily translate back unless you introduce more locals, I guess. Right, so because it's an AST, everything only gets used by its parent, right? So everything's only used once. So if I wanted to reuse tuple components, that would involve storing the tuple to a local and it would be a tuple type local, which then when I emit the binary would, would you know, become a scratch local for each of its elements. Yeah. So I sort of want to ask the dual of the previous question. Um, so you've said you get this two times speed up typically. Yeah. What sort of things are done that are so, in the code that's given to you, yeah. that are so inefficient that you can speed them up by two times? So that's what, what that... What typical optimizations end up happening. Absolutely, yeah. 
that stat was uh, specifically for J to WASM output. So J to WASM is a Java to WebAssembly uh, compiler. The team that works on it actually calls it a transpiler. Um, yeah. Uh, and the, so we, we benefit there. Like, we can look really good because their front end is not trying to do anything fancy at all. All right, they're not doing any optimizations. They're just taking the source code, like emitting WebAssembly in the most trivial way possible from that, and then we take care of the rest. So that 2x is like totally standard stuff that like any optimizing compiler would do. Um, so, uh, you know, even just like dead code elimination and now there are fewer branches, right? Or, uh, you know, we do a lot of more sophisticated things as well. So we'll analyze the WASMGC types across the whole module, and if there are unused fields, we'll get rid of them, all right? So we're modifying the types. Uh, what we can do is we can pre-compute some things. So uh, Java code has tons of vtable lookups, where it's like taking the object, following a pointer to get the vtable, following that to get the function reference. If we can like look at the types and determine that, hey, this type always has this vtable in that field, and this vtable always has this function in that field, we can pre-compute the whole thing and just have that function reference. And then we can directize it and make it a direct function call, which is way faster than an indirect function call. And then we can inline it. So all, all those things. I would imagine inlining. Inlining is a big one. And that one's interesting because the engine, right, V8 in the browser, will also inline. So it's a trade-off. How much do we inline versus how much do they inline? If we inline too much, the code size blows up, and that's no good. If we don't inline enough, then we're leaving performance on the table. So it's a, it's a constant back and forth. So you mentioned it was implemented in C++, and you apologize for that. Thank you. <laughs> but it, I'm wondering to what extent that was a, a good choice or a bad choice. Would, the, would a different language in retrospect have been a better choice, or is C++ a really good choice? And if so, what features of C++ make it that? Yeah, I think C++ is a... Um, it's a pretty decent choice. Of course, pragmatically, it's a great choice because my entire team knows C++, right? That's very pragmatic. Um, I'm sure, you know, we could, we could learn other stuff if we, if we had to. Uh, we talk uh, with, you know, every so often about like, hey, should we introduce some Rust to this project? Because we all want to write Rust instead. It's like C++, but way nicer. Um, uh, I don't know what you're hoping to hear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we would not consider OCaml. Um, none of, nobody's, nobody's trained in it. I had like one OCaml class. I read the textbook, but like mostly forgot it. I I sometimes do stuff in the reference interpreter, but Andreas knows not even that much. Um, yeah, we just we just don't know uh, anything that's that's not C plus <laughs> plus. I mean, there. Right, and, and yeah, so like we're at Google, everything we do is open source, it's on GitHub, so there's like lots of rules that don't apply to us, but in terms of like having talent and being able to like hold a conversation with other people at Google, like we have to have some similarities, and, and part of that's the language we use. In, in some cases, yeah, the question was, is Google adopting Rust and like for, for some things, very niche things, yeah. So I have a provocative question. Yeah. Do you ever worry that Binarian is now too central to the WebAssembly ecosystem if everyone is expecting to feed through it? Uh, I don't think so. Just because it's, you know, open source, right? It's, uh, it's not going to go away tomorrow. It's not going to become unmaintained tomorrow. Um, I think the, the idea of WebAssembly, right, it's as low level as possible, but no lower. So that implies that the tool chains, before you get to the engine, are going to be doing a great deal of the optimization work. So if not Binarian, then everyone else would be having to do that work. So there would be some other optimizer tool, or each tool chain would independently have to write all the same optimizations. So I think we're actually in a much more sustainable world today where we can centralize and share all that work. 
Great, thank you. I think that's a natural place to stop, so let's thank Thomas again.